Okay, so the, um, the science of ADHD over the last 10 years has been quite an adventure. Uh, it's been a story about ingenious designs, uh, about technological innovation, about great team working, and about big data. But there's a profound paradox at the heart of the story. How can we have made so much progress on our journey and still be further away from our destination than we were when we set off? Think about that paradox. <laughs> but as G.K. Chesterton said, every paradox has a solution. And I think in this case, it's that actually our destination has changed. And it's our science that's changed the destination in the journey. We used to think the destination was here. Now we realize it's right at the back over there somewhere with a lot of difficult terrain uh, as we go forward. And most profoundly, I think, we've um, changed the way we think, what we think ADHD is. Uh, no longer do we think it's a unitary biological entity with a simple sort of linear causal structure. Rather, we think it's a, a set or range, a diversity of biological types with a similar clinical expression, each with their own complex and dynamic pattern of causation. So I'm going to give you a, a whistle stop tour through that redefinition, if you like, of ADHD over this, uh, uh, the, last, uh, the last 10 years. How do we change? Oh, great. Make sure I get the button right. Okay, so we've known for a long time that, oh, you've got, I've got a different bar, not the size, I've got the size and the top. So hopefully my slides will fit on. So we know for a long time that ADHD, of course, runs in families. Now the reason for that is complex to work out for one very good reason. That parents, of course, pass on the genes, but they also create the rearing environment. We also know that ADHD is correlated with both genetic risk and with environmental risk, correlated in, in italics there. The natural experiment of twins allows us to partition these two possible causal pathways. And of course it uh, suggests, uh, and we've known this for a long time too, that about 70% of this familial association is uh, due to genetic factors. And all, no, in the BERT estimate, in the BERT, Bert review, uh, it's, uh, Alex BERT, not Cyril BERT, uh, she uh, identified 0% which sh uh, due to shared uh, environmental factors. So the focus has really been on, on um, genetic factors the last 10 years. Of course, which genes? That's the question. That's the first question. Um, and the first thing to say is that understanding uh, the genetics of ADHD has been transformed in the last 10 years. Enormous progress on our journey to this ever-disappearing uh, destination. Then, 10 years ago, we had a kind of a fading optimism that a few biologically plausible genes, particularly those uh, in that uh, control or regulate dopamine activity in the brain, might explain ADHD. Now, there's a sober recognition that it's a very complicated picture. And in fact, because of repeated failed replications of those initial candidate findings, and the uh, vanishingly small effect sizes for each individual gene, candidate gene. We, we estimate that thousands of genes are probably implicated in ADHD. That's a big change over the last 10 years. The, the really fund, the profoundly polygenic nature of ADHD. Of course, that presents a massive methodological challenge, and the development of genome, whole genome scanning has allowed us to rise to that challenge. And our most recent paper, uh, about to be published in Nature Genetics, in fact, is the first to identify genome-wide significant uh, genetic markers, uh, also called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Twelve of these have been identified that meet the very stringent thresholds required when you control for multiple testings, when you're looking at so many hundreds of thousands of markers. However, when you look at even the nominally significant markers, many of these are going to be false positives, you only account for about 
of the estimate, genetic estimate from the twin studies. So clearly there's a, a very large proportion of genetic, uh, uh, genetic uh, effect that we, we can't identify in terms of the genetic, uh, in terms of uh, specific measured genes. And this has been called uh, missing or dark heritability, and that's a major challenge in ADHD genetics, as in other areas of, of uh, psychiatric genetics, of course. Some people have uh, looked to not these common variants, but the rare uh, copy number variants. Uh, and initial findings suggest that these, the so-called, uh, these are large chromosomal effects across multiple genes that involve duplication or replication or inversion of parts of the, 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 the chromosome, uh, were elevated in ADHD. Uh, but again, uh, we find that failure to replicate, chronic failure to replicate, you might even say, has diminished people's enthusiasm for this aspect of the ADHD story. So then, can looking at the relationship between environments uh, and genetic factors, the interplay between genes and environments, help us uh, account for this shortfall uh, in, uh, in, uh, in genetic effects, measured genetic effects? And the, we can also say, as well as massive progress in genetic findings, there have been enormous progress in the way we understand the role of the environment. So then, 10 years ago, ADHD we knew was correlated with a whole range of genetic, uh, sorry, environmental risk factors. Now, we're, we think that many of those correlations aren't in fact causal, but are probably due to gene environment correlation. First, there are so-called passive gene environment correlations. And that's the idea that genes both shape the environment and determine the disorder. The same genes that are passed on by the parents. Let's take maternal smoking an example. We know that maternal smoking during pregnancies is associated with a two or three-fold increase in the risk for ADHD. If that's a, a real effect of the exposure, then we'd effect, expect that to persist if independent of the genetic relationship between the rearing mother and the child. The, the ingenious IVF natural experiments that were done by Anita Thapa and Gordon Harold uh, tested this by comparing this association in the uh, um, um, children uh, conceived through egg donation and sperm donation clearly varies the genetic relationship with the, with the mother. Clever, clever design. And of course they found that when you control for genetics in this way, the environmental effect disappeared, supporting the notion it's really a gene environment correlation and an effect of the actual exposure. So then is the relationship between the uh, ADHD, the genes and the environment reversed? so-called evocative gene environment correlations. And adoption studies suggest that genes can evoke uh, uh, negative parenting, for instance, or maybe other adverse effects, via their role in determining ADHD. That over time in development, exacerbate ADHD and create complications like childhood oppositional problems. Evocative uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, passive and evocative gene environment correlations, clearly important. The third in aspect of interplay that's been, uh, th that we know a lot more about now uh, is uh, gene environment interaction. So is it the fact that environmental risks are being missed because they're conditioned by genetic factors? So the idea that you're only getting the effect of an adverse environment if the child is carrying particular genes. So then, 10 years ago, we, there was one or two gene environment interaction studies, mostly around uh, maternal smoking. Now there's been loads of reports of uh, gene environment interactions, but usually in relatively small and low-powered studies, and, and very few of them have been replicated. So I think we still need to be a little bit skeptical about the potential gene environment interactions.
So overall, normative environments seem to play a rather marginal and rather subtle role, complex role in ADHD etiology. What about extreme environments? Could they, could extreme adversity um, uh, override genetic effects with direct effects on brain plasticity to create ADHD or cause ADHD? And so uh, our study, the English Romanian adoptee study that Mike Rutter set up, uh, of course, uh, has looked at this. And we find a seven-fold increase in ADHD in adults who are exposed to deprivation. And it's very unlikely that those effects are due to uh, uh, background genetic or pre- and perinatal risk in those children. We also know a lot about um, psychopath uh, the pathophysiology of ADHD. Just very quickly, so then we had this idea that ADHD was a single biological, neurobiological entity caused by deficits in so-called executive functioning linked to uh, prefrontal cortex dysfunction. Now we're focused much more on the networks and the communication within those networks, the executive network, and looking at disconnectivity as a possible mediator uh, in ADHD. We also think of ADHD now as a very heterogeneous condition with multiple neurobiological pathways. Yes, executive functions are probably a one pathway, one target for treatment, but there's also the reward pathways, the emotion regulation pathways, and the so-called default mode pathway related to introspection, prospection, and mind wandering. And it's possible that these different pathways uh, cleave in dissociable ways into different groups or subtypes of ADHD. And I think it's a very important focus for, for future precision medicine approaches in ADHD, targeting these different pathways in these different groups of, of people. So overall, what have we learned? I think we've learned an awful lot, but the goal of that, that destination is still a long way off. Highly heritable disorder, likely implicating thousands of common risk alleles of small effect, and rare variants of large effect, perhaps. Normative environments like to play a marginal role once gene environment correlations are accounted for. Extreme postnatal adversity may override genetic factors to cause ADHD. And the pathophysiology of ADHD is distributed, complex, and heterogeneous. So future progress, I think, in, in understanding causal uh, complexity will require longitudinal studies of the, the transactions between genes, environments, brain structure, function, and cognition, just the sort of research that we're trying to set up here uh, in the department. Thank you.